My name is Susan Fuchlin. I'm 52 years old. Uh, today's date is May the 2nd, 2008. I'm in Sacramento, California. I'm here with my mother, and I'm going to be talking to her. My name's Joan Hessian. I'm 80 years old. Today's date is May the 2nd, 2008, and we're in Sacramento. And I am the mother of Susan. Okay. I'm going Start. to talk to you today about um, about your life when you were growing up in England. Um, it's a period, obviously, I know nothing about, and I'd be very interested to get as much of your experience as possible. So let's start at the beginning, and can you tell me where and when you were born? I was born on the 12th of June, 1927. I was born in Birmingham, which is the city of my family on both sides, my mother and my father. I was born in a... <coughs> Sorry. I was born in a house that my parents shared with a sister and brother-in-law. And the reason for that was that there was still a housing shortage and people were short of money as a result of the slump after the First World War. The house, in fact, belonged to my grandparents. But it was a shared home at that moment in time. And your grandparents were living there with you? No, they had a separate house. Um, they had, as you know, I have lots of aunts and uncles, etc. So everybody lived in one particular area, and my grandparents owned a number of houses at the time in that area, in which their various sons and daughters lived as and when they got married, which did ease the. Ha they were really very fortunate because they were quite nice houses for the of the time. You know, they weren't what we'd call modern houses. But they were very nice houses, and it did mean that the families had, their sons and daughters had a house when they first got married, even though they probably had to share it, as my parents did. And they were close by as well. And they were close by. And how long did you stay there? I think, I don't remember. But uh, Estelle, whom you know, my elder cousin, she was a little girl at the time. She's three years older than I am, and she remembers me as a little baby being bathed. And she assures me that she did me with powder and all the bits that you powder babies with. So I think I was probably about 18 months old when we moved from that house. And where did you move to? Not very far away. The original house, because you know the area, the original house I was born in was near Cannon Hill Park in Edgbiston, Borsal Heath. And we moved a short distance to another house owned by my grandparents in George Street, Borsal Heath. And that's where I stayed until I was about six. And then you moved out into the suburbs, country suburbs. Yeah, newly developed area. But the house in George Street was quite interesting because, again, there was an aunt and uncle who lived, Harold and Dorothy, lived up the avenue at the side, so mm -hmm. they were very nearby. Edgar and Marjorie lived down the next street, so they were near. It was very much a family enclave, which was good. How did it feel when you moved away from that sort of family environment? My mother and father were pleased. You know, I went. they went mainly for my health reasons because I'd had this dreadful bronchitis when I was a child, living in what was almost in the city. My mother and father were delighted about it. My grandparents, they really thought they'd gone to the moon <laughs> because nobody had lived beyond the city boundary before. And it was good because we were the first people who had modern in the sense of built after the First World War. The house we moved to was newly built when we went. It was totally new, unmade garden, etc. So like building out in real rural area. And how far outside the city was it? About three miles beyond the outer city of, the, of Birmingham, mm -hmm. beyond where the corporation buses ran to and, and corporation transport. And what was the new suburb like? What, what sort of facilities were there? It had been built along a main road which went out to Stratford-on-Avon, so the main road had always existed, and there had been a small little village there with an old church, etc. And then they built on what had been farm fields. What was it like? As you'd get a, a rural a development of suburban housing in a load of ro in a you know different roads off one another. They always built a shopping centre when they built a new, a new suburb, so you had a shopping centre. You had doctor's surgeries were set up. There was always a library. Mm. 
and we had a park which we called a, which was known as a recreational area but not in the sense of the size of you've got a recreational areas over here but it was a completely self-contained community, self -community. <clears throat> and the mothers always shopped locally i mean you didn't go anywhere else because people didn't women certainly didn't have cars and and what what was your and a fish and chip shop what was your father's job at the, at that time my father was a representative for a firm that made big combination grates called triplex grates. And that was the time when coal was used a great deal. So he was a representative for them. It was a job he had eventually after he came from the First World War. And he's, the company grew. And the area that he covered was the west of England, including Wales. And he was away every week from Monday morning until Friday night. And then on Saturday morning, because people worked a five and a half day week, on Saturday morning he used to go across to the main factory, which was at Tipton, which is in fact in the black country. So Dad used to get home really at about half past one on a Saturday afternoon. And then he was off again on Monday morning. Mm, a short weekend. But a holiday weekend. Every weekend was a holiday weekend. My mother was a very practical woman, and she looked after everything. She did the gardening, she did everything. When Dad came home, it was holiday time. Mm. Great fun, because he did took life much more easily, you know, and life was meant to be fun. And every weekend was like a holiday. It was great. So at least even though he had an hour, only a day and a half off, it was a relaxing day and a half. It was a family time. Mm -hmm. And we used to do quite a lot of entertaining. He loved having people, family and friends and things like that. No, it was a good time. And um, so how long did you stay in Shirley in, in relation to the start of the war? Were you still living there when the yes. war started? We stayed there really quite a long time. We were there when the war started, um, which was in 1939. And we'd been there from about 1934. And that's when things really started to change. And I know you, you had said that uh, some people were evacuated um, or their schools were evacuated. Did that affect you? Because we lived outside the boundary of the city of Birmingham, the national evacuations were all done for city schools. My school was outside. And therefore, at my school wasn't... We were... I mean, as though being outside a boundary made it safe it didn't but they had to make some geographical boundaries so schools outside cities were not evacuated but I don't, I don't see how you would evacuate a whole school I mean where they, would they go to and well there must have been plans made which I don't know anything about but a school as I said Estelle went to Warwick and the whole of their grammar school including the staff went to Warwick and shared the facilities of Warwick School. So you had classes that started earlier in the morning till lunchtime, which might be the host school, and then the evacuated school used the same premises and the same facilities in the afternoon. Uh -huh. And you were just evacuated on and distributed amongst the population. They'd known beforehand who'd got spare rooms. And you... When you set off from your home, which is what I find so amazing now, I can't imagine parents letting their children go away to an unknown destination to stay with unknown people. That I find quite incomprehensible. Perhaps it was just the circumstances dictated it and there wasn't much choice. I think the thing was that to protect the young, the children, the next generation was uppermost in everybody's mind. Because you actually also went away and stayed with an aunt, uh, stayed with cousins, and I went away with my aunt and my cousins to stay with relatives of hers, only because Marjorie, with her young children, the only school children were officially evacuated, and hers were under school age, and I went because I had to be taken care of, <laughs> <laughs> and we went to Burnham on Sea. And because the blitzes didn't start as soon as they'd expected, nothing happened for the first year. There were no air raids or anything in the first year. So if you, were, hadn't, if you went officially with your school, you couldn't come back. 
because your school had been evacuated, the staff and everything, so you couldn't come back. But people who went privately, as I did, a lot of people came back beforehand. I only stayed there a short time. So you came back and then the air raid started? and They started the following, in the next autumn, yes. But I'd never been away from home before without my mummy and my daddy, <laughs> and I didn't like it. <laughs> what was it like... Um, when you came back and the air raid started and there was, you know, all the other things involved with the war, the gas masks, the blackouts, what was that like? Have you ever seen a gas mask? I have seen a gas mask, yes, usually in antique shops. <laughs> Weird things. You went everywhere. I think they were so, the authorities were so concerned that there would be gas attacks. It was the first thing you were issued with. And you see pictures now of all these little school children on railway stations. Everybody had a gas mask in a cardboard box, which was about eight inches by four by four, on a tape. You had your name on it. And wherever you went, you took your gas mask with you. And you had that. And then you would go to school in the morning and you practice putting these dreadful things on. They were made of rubber and they fitted over your head and your eyes popped out. You know, you had sort of goggle effects on them. But they were just second nature to you. And then eventually the cardboard boxes used to get knocked about. And then we had tins to put our gas masks in. And under my sink at the moment is a tall tin with string in it. And it is an old gas mask tin. But you never needed to actually wear them because no. fortunately... And we had blitz... Because our school was outside, we had air raid shelters on the playing field. So if the air raids came during the day... It was okay because you missed class and everybody trooped down to the air raid shelter. <laughs> and um, what about, uh, you, you talked to, to me earlier about the uh, blackout situation and, and how the, all the windows had to be covered with black, black material. Yeah, black material, yes, absolutely. And all down the corners had to be done. And there were air raid wardens for every street to make sure that if you had an attack... I mean, they were trained people for first aid, etc. But if you had a chink of light, they came and knocked on the door and uh, said... You should, and it was horrendous. I mean, you, you didn't... If anybody, you had sort of curtains across the doors. If anybody came out, you sort of went through because it was total blackout. So there were no street lights at, at all? No, no street lights, no illumination. The idea was to make everywhere... You could, they couldn't black everything out. Um, because some things reflected light. And the air raids, they tended to bomb a particular area for a, for a concentrated length of time. So there might be weeks when we didn't have any in Birmingham. But because Birmingham was such an industrial area, it had a lot of air raids. And as you know, our family business was burnt out. Yes. In a, in a, the fire attacks were that. But then compared with London, we got off quite lightly. The only thing that happened to us at school was we had a lot of small explosive bombs which landed on the playing fields, which was hard luck because it was about the only thing that I really enjoyed was the <laughs> playing fields. And we didn't have anything in my house. But as you know, a lot of the relatives were also, because they had lived in this concentrated area around Mosley and Borsal Heath, a lot of them were... Their houses were damaged, but nobody was hurt. And they were all able to remove their furniture from the damaged houses. And they put it in a store or something or other. So there was nobody in your immediate family that lost everything? No, no, we were fortunate. And that was lucky, very lucky. And um, how did the rationing affect you as a, as a young teenager? I don't think it did. Um, because I didn't have to make the rations go around. That was my mother's job. I mean, there were no sweets. There weren't sweets for years and years and years. There were no. There was very little fruit because a lot of... You see, the importation of food was on essentials. The biggest thing was to get the essential food in with the food convoys. So anything incidental with that. But it was restriction I think but I was never conscious of deprivation no no and we were never hungry and it was interesting because you substituted other things I mean families that 
had very sweet tooth, for instance, suffered very much. But then you used golden syrup. You put golden syrup in things that you made uh, to save on the sugar. Mm. And you had bread and scrape because butter was practically non-existent. So something's moving. Um, so it was substitution. And then people grew as much as they could in their gardens. I mean, dig and dig for victory. There were lots of slogans during the war. Dig for victory was one of them. And we had an amazing food minister whose name was Waldron, I think. And he would put propaganda, I mean, the amount of propaganda that was fed to the population. If there was a plenty of potatoes going, for instance, you'd be inundated on the radio with recipes using potatoes. So it was surprising, really, I think, how people managed and reacted. Maybe they became more creative as a result of the Possibly restrictions. So. And you didn't have the people putting on too much weight, that was for sure. So now, um, after you lived in Shirley, you moved out to Hopwood mm -hmm. uh, where you're with your grandfather. Can mm -hmm. you tell me about that, why, why you did that and, and what your grandfather was like? <laughs> We moved out there because my grandfather, who had lived in the main family house in this area, which had been so badly damaged, and he had been a widower since the new year of 1939. And he was very much the patriarch of the family because he had these sons and daughters, and he was very much the patriarch. And for some reason or other, it was decided that he needed to re-establish a home of his own again. And my mother was the eldest daughter, and I think she felt responsible. So we moved from our nice house that we had had at Shirley, where we'd all been so happy as a little three-family fa three group, to this house at Hopwood, which was further outside Birmingham, in a more rural area. And we had this larger house, so it was enough for my grandfather to have his own sitting room with his own furniture and a bedroom. It was a very nice house. It had been built about 1930, late 37, early 38. So from those days, it was very, very modern and spacious with a large garden. Um, was, was, he, was he living, and I realise he was in the house, but d did he have his own sort of no. separate area or was he with you for meals and really participating he in the really family He was really part life? of the family and everything revolved around him to a great extent. And he, you can't understand really how patriarchal he was because he had always, and I do mean always, had a boiled egg for his breakfast until the war came. We had to keep hens and chickens so that my grandfather could have a boiled egg for his breakfast. If there were two boiled, if there were two eggs, then somebody else had one. But if not, my grandfather had one. It was a very strange situation. He also brought a billiard table with him, a pool table, would you call it? Mm -hmm. which was quite a, not a full-sized one, but quite a large one. And that came as well, and it was on a slate bed, so it was a good table. So we had to have a very large dining table, which we had to lift up every time Grandpa wanted to have a game of billiards with anybody, this, di this great heavy table. So I learned to play billiards when I was younger. But very much it evolved around what my grandfather wanted, my mother wasn't having good health at that time. but She created a most beautiful garden. She was very creative in making gardens, literally making gardens. And, she'd, and it was a large piece of land, quite wide, but also very long, and it had been a field. And she had help from some Italian prisoners of war because the Italian prisoners of war that were taken were often put to work on farms because they had been agricultural workers in Italy, most of them. And the Italians were not soldiers. They were not like the Germans. I mean, they were very reluctant. So the farm that was just up the road from where we lived in Hopwood had billeted on them for work as Italian prisoners of war who worked on the farm at the weekends, um, during the week, sorry, and then the weekends they were free. And my mother got to know them and they came and worked for her. And they made a most beautiful garden. They did the heavy digging parts out. We had a lovely pool and things. But they were a regular part. We all seemed to sort of collect people. 
she fed them, she gave them, and they were they were good fun because they were much happier doing that. They thought I think sure. they thought they were really very lucky. Lucky. So did they come with their um, guard or, or no? They'd... There was no guard with them. A farm would have two or three Italians based on them. There were no guards, were no soldiers over them, hmm. and the Italians didn't want to run away. <laughs> They were very happy to be there. <laughs> and they lived with the family, uh, the farm family they lived in. And a lot of them, of course, quite a number of places, they married Ita English girls and stayed on afterwards. Not a bad life as a prisoner of war, really. So now this um, house, you said that there was um, the uh, barrage balloon site opposite and the, and the RAF women were working there? Yes. Is that correct? Women's Royal Air Force were the, were the WAFs. The Women's Army were the ATS. The ATS were the ATS, that was the Army. The women in the Air Force were the RAF. And the girls in the Navy were the RENs, Women's Royal Naval Services. They wore Air Force uniform, but they wore skirts most of the time. And then they kept, gave them slacks after that. But originally they were wearing skirts and black stockings and shoes. And they were billeted. It was a big field with this huge barrage balloon. And they lived on site with the men as well. And they had been there, I presume, for quite a long time before we got there. And the girls would do a stint there for probably a year or so, and then they'd be moved to somewhere else. But they were girls who'd been called up because girls were also called up for services or res reserved occupation, so you didn't have any option. I mean, you had to go into what you were and, doing. And how did it come about that they ended up coming to your house to wash their hair and primp and pamper themselves? They'd got wash houses on the site, which were ablution blocks. That was the word that was used, ablution block. I suppose the, the Air Force men had their own and the girls had theirs as well, but they were literally sort of sinks and taps and things like that, and my mother who was a very outgoing person, must have talked to them one day, and they said what they really wanted was somewhere nice to wash their hair. So we had a bath rotor. They used to come over by arrangement. It was always by arrangement. And they'd come, and they had the use of our bathroom. And, of course, hot water and probably nice smelly soap compared with what they had. And they did. They took as long as they liked, and they had, a, you know, really... Pampered, pampered themselves, and that became a regular thing. There was always somebody in our bathroom. Fortunately, we, well, we had a good bathroom, but it, they didn't come early in the morning or when we were likely to need it. It was during the day, and my father found it quite entertaining because he used to say, well, there's always some na semi-naked girl going around somewhere or other. <laughs> but that was worthwhile, and they all stopped a, a while afterwards. I'm sure they appreciated it. Yes, they did. They thought it was a bit of home from home. Mm. I think that's what all these girls and these young men missed, was being suddenly taken away from their own environment and sent to a new part of the country because people didn't travel previously. I mean, you lived in your own little enclave and that was it. But I think this is what they really missed, was being literally uplift, taken from their own area. And then in addition to the women, you also uh, hosted, your family hosted the injured servicemen? That grew. They were young men who had been damaged neuro neurologically, neurologically <laughs> um, mainly. And they had to do part of their recovery treatment was to go out for good walks, fresh air and exercise and different environments. So they went on these long walks. And then it became an official thing. They came to us and had a tea or a lunch or something. We were the turning point for them and that was good they used to bring their own rations with them so we did quite well out of that anything they didn't eat we had left over as well which was good it was usually something pretty substantial but lots of tea and usually sugar as well but that was good because again the authorities in the hospital wanted them to have a family atmosphere we became part of the official program of them and they'd stay and they'd sit in armchairs or they'd sit in the garden. And they just sort of felt relaxed. relaxed. Mm. Yeah. And then we had one or two who'd got a wife 
and the mother would say, well, if you... We were never allowed to have the men to stay with their wives, but we could have the wives to stay, only one at a time. And there was one particular couple that I think my mother took a particular liking to, and his wife used to come quite regularly and stay with us. And then she'd see more of her husband. But it was good for that, and it was interesting. We'd all sit round the table and have a meal. And they were interesting people because they'd had such different backgrounds. It must have added quite a bit of company to the family, and and, and for you as an only child, it, it was did opened up it, it your opened a uh, lot. horizons. Yes, it did. It was in really interesting, because we've always been a, a family who've been interested in people and things. But it was that was a good, a good thing to do, mm-hmm. good for us and them. And um, looking back on your childhood, what what would you say are your best memories? Is there any one thing that sticks out, or is it or no, nothing much. I think I was fortunate. I don't know whether I was fortunate to be an only child or not. I don't think I was. I would much prefer to have had some siblings. But it was a comfortable childhood. I was taken great care of. And I think on the whole, my early childhood, I think of as being very fun and comfortable. got more tedious as I got out in my teenagers. I didn't like teenage years. And that was when the difficulties started to arise of being, living outside Birmingham and things like that. I didn't ha- my cousins were always very important to me, so they took the place of brothers and sisters, and I've always been very close to them. I've never had a great circle of friends. I've always been one of these people who tended to have a best friend. Who was your best friend, would you say, when you were in your teenage years? I can't remember school ones. I remember college ones. She was an interesting girl. I met her when I went to college. And she was a Quaker. And they were involved with the Cadbury factory at Bourneville. And that opened up a whole lot of people and things that I hadn't been... She belonged to Cadbury. Her father worked for Cadbury's at their factory in Bourneville. And the Quakers are very socially minded and very welfare-minded, and they had youth clubs and things like that, and I used to go with my friend. Her name was Olive Woodwiss. I can still visualise her. And then eventually I went, when she got married, I went to a Quaker wedding, which was quite an experience, because the man she married wasn't a Quaker. And you, make, you go to the meeting hall and you wait for the spirit to move you. In other words, there's no structure to the service. And I can remember it now. It was really quite um, difficult because you sort of thought, well, when are they actually going to marry? (laughs) But I lost contact with her. I don't know why I lost contact with her, but something we just did. And we'd been friends for many, many years. So you were friends even after you left college? Yes, because we went, oh, I know what happened. We got a job together. And with the electricity board, we both got the same job. But she didn't like it and she didn't fit in. And that's how we must have lost track with each other because I stayed on and she didn't. Mm. And that was that. Drifted apart. Mm. So um, you were at Domestic Science College. And mm. what? how long for and what did, what did that involve? What were you studying while you were there? That was the real disadvantage of doing it in wartime because there were so many restrictions. And there were so many things that one would have done at a domestic science college before the war. I mean, we did cuisine, but we didn't do any oat about it. There was no chance of doing really high-class, luxurious food. But I learned to cook, which I'd always done, because my mother had frequently had bouts of illness, etc. So I think I, I've been cooking all my life, I think. And there were all sorts of things that you did there in the broad sense of anything to do with domestic economy. It has new names now. It's not called domestic science. It's called home economics. It had limitations because of the rationing, which is a pity. But it was very broad. We did dietetics. We did theory. We did dressmaking. I learned to... I made a smock, uh, a little smock dress, which I kept thinking one of the... It was a pretty little smock dress. And I thought, well, if I ever have a little girl she'll be able to wear it. I did have a little girl, but she was a big little girl. 
And my pretty dress, which I've still got in a box that I smocked all those years ago, has never been worn. I think it was meant to be put on a five-pound baby. <laughs> but that was interesting. And that was in Oozel Street. Now, if you think of Broad Street in Birmingham, it's now all been redeveloped. But it was a big Victorian um, building with staircases. And we were taught to whip egg whites. There was no electric, electrical equipment, electric whisks. Everything was done by hand. How long? Everything was done by hand. So you were, I was taught to iron with a flat iron. I was taught to whisk eggs by using a knife and a plate, not hand whisks. So we went back to basics. And that was good. And, and I've you, always used it since then. You And you were lucky enough to get jobs using your skills as yes. well. Yes. Different parts of it, the practical side, and also the dietetics that we had done was very useful when I went to work in the hospital. And I used the electrical part of it because I got a job with the electric industry. I'd just like to move on and just ask you a couple of questions about um, how you met my dad. Um, I know you knew him when you were very little children, you, or you, you met him at least when you were very little. Can you just tell me the family connection there? His aunt, Auntie B, was my mother, a great friend of my mother's. This particular aunt hadn't any children. Patrick was her ne nephew. So frequently if we went to see my mother's friend, her nephew would be there. And we have got this little photograph, little snapshot of Dad and I when we were about six or no, we must have been less than six, five, holding these two puppy dogs. And fortunately, I didn't see him in the interim period, because if we'd grown up together and known each other all the time, we were 10, 11 and 12, we probably wouldn't have been interested. The aunt, in fact, got married years later, and my parents went to the wedding, and I couldn't go, because I was working, and you didn't have days off work because to go to a wedding. And they met this boy or young man who was in army uniform at the wedding and who said that he was Pat Hessian. And they came back afterwards and said, oh, we've met somebody you used to know years ago called Pat Hessian. And I said, oh, yes. And they said, yes, he was in the army and he was home for his aunt's wedding. And the next day he telephoned me. And I was absolutely flabbergasted and I didn't know whether to meet him or not. Anyway, we did. And we met. On that Sunday afternoon, he'd got 48 hours leave and we met. And somehow or other we clicked. At least I did. I think I fell for him. And that was it. He went back to Catterick, which was in Yorkshire. And then he came down on 48 hours leave the next weekend. And we met again. And he was in the army for another year after we'd met. But he used to have 48 hours leave. And he was always terribly clothes conscious, as you remember. Mm -hmm. And he'd come home in his army uniform and immediately change into civilians. And somehow he had nice clothes in those days. But it must have been hard on his mother and father because he used to come and spend all his weekend leave with me. Yes, so that was it. Probably didn't appreciate that so much, but... Uh, I don't think his parents did. No. And he didn't take me to meet his parents for a long, long time. The people he took me to meet, and I had to have their approval, was Auntie Doris and Uncle Ralph. We went up to Manchester one weekend, and I really feel that I was being paraded in front of them, and if they didn't approve of me, I was out. But fortunately, we, they did approve, and they were very close to us. And how long was it between the time that you met him and the time you got married? Uh nearly four years we married when we were 23 I'd wanted we'd wanted to get engaged on my 21st birthday because he'd been demobbed and had got a job and there was no reason why we shouldn't but my parents wouldn't hear of it we had to wait another six months before we got engaged and in those days you had an engagement by which time you saved up in things or well, maybe you had two parties that way one for your 21st and one for your engagement no it was Christmas when we got engaged oh. But it was it was an interesting time because he used to come home on 48 hours leave. And that was it, you know. You had to make the most of the time available. Yeah. And uh, just briefly to wind up, do um, you have any favourite stories from your marriage? Too many. 
No, it was a good time. Okay. Thank you very much Is that for it? sharing your experiences with us. You have more knowledge of your background, my background anyway. How long was that? <laughs>